Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Dr. Nancy Lindisfarne and Dr. Jonathan Neal to tell us all about their just published book titled Why Men? A Human History of Violence and Inequality, published by Hearst in 2023. This book is fabulous and fascinating and asks some really big questions, like how did humans, a species that evolved to be cooperative and egalitarian, nonetheless develop societies of really quite enforced inequality? Why do we have patriarchy and warfare all over the place? Um, Was this inevitable? What can we understand um, poking into these questions? So Nancy and Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast to delve into all of this. Thank you. Lovely for you to introduce us like that. That's very exciting. Um, Well, before we get into the book and all of its many exciting things, would you please introduce yourselves a little bit and explain how you came to write this and write it together? (laughs) Yes. Um, We both trained as anthropologists and the fieldwork I did in the Middle East, in Iran and Afghanistan, meant that I was working with women, uh, thinking about gender, wrote a book about the politics of marriage, and came back to Britain, which is where I'm based, um, and got very much involved in the kind of women's lib anthropology of women sort of stuff, and went on from there to write about masculinity. So, Kind of from the beginning of time, I've been thinking as an anthropologist about gendered issues. And then we met. <laughs> and I would started out as an anthropologist and I did some fieldwork in Afghanistan. But then I moved on to do other jobs, eventually got a PhD in history. But what I what particularly influenced me was that I spent 10 years working as an abortion counselor in a feminist abortion clinic in London. And then I spent six years working as an HIV counselor at the height of the epidemic in London. And also, so those that gave me a, a very wide interest in gender, but also I was a gendered human being and I'd had my share of joy and sorrow (laughs) in relationships and so on. And I've been thinking hard, trying to think hard analytically about gender. But when I met Nancy, she thought I basically knew nothing. (laughs) We certainly didn't just, we we disagreed madly at the beginning, which was difficult, actually. Um, But we also realized that we were both really, really interested in, wanted to find a solution for ourselves about a a very basic question, which is how and why and when gender relations change. In other words, we were coming to this with a kind of historical perspective and wanting to understand changes. There was obviously something that wasn't fixed. Um, Gender relations are different now and a decade ago or a century ago and so forth. And so basically from the get-go, we have been worried with this kind of thing. And what we came up with now about 10 years ago was an argument that finally seemed to make sense to us. And it In effect, it's an argument which focuses on love, and indeed our book is about love and about how love endures and about our human disposition to fairness, to equality. What we're saying is that we're social animals and we actually needed, when we came down to the savannah, we needed love to survive. But as we thought about this, we realized that paradoxically, we also understand how our capacity for kindness, for empathy, can imprison us in very ruthless competition, in very violent hierarchies, which is where you started your introduction with that question. And we went further and realized there's another twist in all this, that our deep need for love, fairness, and so forth also fuels resistance. 
we suggest that love explains why ordinary people, people like ourselves, resent and resist inequality. We resist lies. We hate corruption. We dislike nepotism. We don't like unfairness. And so what the book is working through are these contradictions, which we believe are actually at the center of all of our lives. And I suppose then exploring these contradictions is really at the center of the book. What a fabulous introduction um, to the book and a fascinating sort of backstory that brought you to it. Thank you for starting us off that way. Um, I'd love to start kind of before we actually get into, Nancy, as you've given us a hint of sort of the answers that you came to, I think it's important, um, as you've done in the book, to kind of debunk some myths to begin with, to kind of clear the slate a little bit. You talk about in the beginning of the book, there's sort of fantasy posing as science. There's evolutionary psychology that's actually not great science. Can we sort of get rid of some of these misconceptions? Why is there this bad science? What bad science are we talking about that we need to make sure not to fall into those traps of? Shall I do this? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, we, we're arguing in the book that we get against what we unkindly call the big boy theories of evolution. Uh, these are the versions that are promulgated in, by Steven Pinker, Jared Diamond, E.O. Wilson, and many others. The theories that used to be called socio sociobiology and are now more called evolutionary psychology. And these are the ideas that explain evolution by saying that the driving force of evolution is masculine competition, that men are naturally violent, that people are naturally greedy and selfish, and that men compete with each other to, to dominate other men in order to dominate women, in order to have more sex with more women and pass on their genes. And this is, a, this is by now a very familiar paradigm. Um, and it's, um, it's, it, our problem with it really is not that it's politically conservative, although a lot of these writers are very politically conservative. Our problem is that it's bad science. I think the best way to explain why is to explain the idea of adaptation, that we take in our book, too, from biology. The idea of adaptation means that there's a niche in a wider ecological system. Each species has a niche. And that niche is, it includes the, or the wider ecology in which they live, how they get their food, what they eat, who they eat it with, what kind of society they have, if they have territories, what hierarchies exist, how they communicate with each other, how they raise their young, how they protect themselves from predators by fighting back or by fleeing or by concealing themselves, the, the what rivalries they have within the society, the, the whole, the, what their bodies are like, their tails, their skeleton, every bit of it. That's the adaptation. And when, but the reason that the evolutionary psychology people uh, are, do bad science, it's when they start, when they do this stuff about animals and animal behavior, it's not bad science. By and large, it's good science. They do the work, they do the research, they read other people's papers, they use the idea of adaptation in very much the, the way that we do. Um, and so their stuff on gelato baboons or on ants is good, useful stuff usually. The difficulty comes when they start, when they go on to compare um, animal society, uh, animal societies and animal adaptations to human society. And the difficulty there, there's two, two of them. One is that they don't do the work. They don't do the reading. They don't read social science. Instead of reading social science, they assume that they already understand what human society is like. And they understand it by starting out from their own society and starting out with things people said in their fraternity or things they learned in high school or, or just random, what a really random series of prejudices about um, how societies work. 
that's one difficulty. The other difficulty is that they pull out um, from human society, they pull out one behavior and they compare it to one behavior in bonobos or one behavior in gorillas. They don't compare an adaptation to a, a particular human adaptation to a particular ecology and uh, technology. Um, and this, uh, this produces a, a lot of work that's, <laughs> that's, that's not connected. That's not connected. That doesn't work scientifically. Um, they they constantly take things out of science, out of context, and not only that, um, they usually compare uh, animal behavior to one particular aspect of the society that they're in. To how usually how reasonably affluent professional people live in the United States. Just take one startling example. They rely on psychology experiments done at Yale and Stanford to argue that human beings are competitive and cruel rather than to see what the, the, what these study, these psychology experiments actually prove is that men who go to Yale and Stanford are competitive and cruel. <laughs> It's sloppy. And there are these problems of method. And so our challenge is, I suppose, we could say we're offering a a feminist ecology in the book because we try to be very careful with our comparisons. Uh, We certainly do look at our complex adaptations as human beings. And What's also different is we pay particular attention to examples of friendship and fairness and sharing and equality as a counter, as a balance to these mainstream ideas, this mainstream emphasis on the the, the kind of dominant ideas in the media, I suppose, about hierarchy and aggression. We're not saying that there isn't hierarchy and aggression, but we're looking at the underside of that, the the side of the people that are dominated, um, the people who are forced to be submissive, and also putting their point of view into the equation, the understanding of an adaptation. Hmm. Thank you for taking us through that um, and doing some myth busting. I think that's very helpful to now hopefully do some better science um, and talk about the better science that you both do in the book. Um, Thinking about these investigations of other primates and the ecological environment that they're in and kind of the bigger picture stuff that it helps explain um, how humans evolved, uh, what relationships we have with other primates, what physical and genetic differences between humans and other primates? There, of course, are some, and also some that are more similar than we might think in that dominant narrative. What do these things tell us about the development of this more nuanced idea of human society, this more kind of collaborative, cooperative side of things? Uh Maybe, Miranda, the place to start with this is to just make a say something about the newness of the evidence that we're using. Um, in the last 20 years, 25 years, there has been just a remarkable amount of new science that's coming out. And it's from primatologists, it's from anatomists, it's studies of early human evolution, archaeologists. And there are so many new technologies around DNA, around LIDAR, around these microanalyses of, of pollen, of bits of food, of, of feces, and so forth, so that scientists now can tell you more or less um, what people living in some cave shelter 40,000 years ago actually had for breakfast. It is utterly remarkable. And so this is also a difference that moves us beyond the the bad science. So when we're talking about, to answer your question, we're also looking at, looking from the point of view of these new materials as best we can. Can, can I come in with a, yeah. a bit more on this? Yeah. But also we're looking, that gives us that gives us the archaeology. We can see over time a lot about how the adaptation was changing. But there's all, another thing, piece kind of evidence, is the the actual changes. If you look at what 
human beings are like now, physically and genetically, and you look at what the common ancestor of us and gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos was like, and it, um, if you look at that, there's an enormous number of changes. We uh, there's changes in our in our genitals and our sexuality um, uh, that we have to have explanations for human. Uh, female humans have labia, the clitoris has been moved forward. Um, there's a, the canines are much smaller, which tells us something about aggression. Um, in the human, in the in human evolution, the differences in size between males and females have gotten much smaller. Uh, there's a enormous number of changes, uh, in our arms and our fingers and our shoulders that go with hunting. Um, we live longer. We live past the age of menopause. The, the difference in birth intervals between the young are different. Um, there are many more of these. And maybe as we go on explaining what's in the book, we can fit these physical changes into the evidence from the archaeology Nancy was talking about, and also into the evidence we have from anthropologists who lived with hunters and gatherers over the last hundred years. Is that the answer? I think that's it's a good place to start anyway. <laughs> it's a fabulous place to start. Um, I'd love to ask, obviously, so this is a good moment to highlight to listeners, of course, that all those things, Jonathan, especially that you just mentioned, all of those uh, changes are very much you go into fabulous detail in the book um and we're doing a little bit more of a highlights tour in this interview so anyone who's like oh wait i want to know about that one please do go read the book i promise it's all there um but i am going to kind of pick out a few things to ask in more detail and i'd love to pick up on the one um the arms and shoulders the idea of hunting being something that um humans have adapted particularly to both physically and also in the book, you talk about this in terms of how it impacted social relations, gender relations. What does specializing in hunting have to do with gender relations? This is this is odd and counterintuitive. What happened with hunting was a division of labor between men and women that made men and women more equal. This is difficult to understand. So let's start out. Many different changes with when hunting came together to produce a new adaptation of inequality. The first thing is early humans moved out from the forest in Africa onto the savanna, the plains. And on the plains, we invented the digging stick. This was new. Primates had lived uh, mostly on leaves and fruit. But once we had the digging stick, we could live on tubers which no other primates and very few other animals were, were eating. This was a new source of nourishment. And people also invented tools for a particular kind of hunting that's called ambush hunting. Um, they would sneak up on the big animals at the center of the herd and wound them with a weapon a spear, an arrow, a boomerang, and chase them down. And this went together with an enormous number of changes in our, uh, in, in our body, in our delivery system for a spear. <laughs> so the, the, what we have is an enormous number of powerful levers, mm. <laughs> starting with the shoulder blade and the shoulder and the elbow and the wrist and the, the fingers and moving through the uh, a levered tool. And uh, the flexibility of our upper bodies and of our necks and heads, too. Yes. The um, huge, yeah. Anatomical changes. Um, and then what happened was that the humans bought home all of the tubers and all of the meat at the end of the day to a shared home place. Not a family home place, but a, a home place for a small band. And there they used fire to cook it. Fire was our third grade adaptation. Digging sticks, <laughs> uh, ambush hunting tools, and fire. And then after they cooked it, they shared the food with the whole band. And they had to share because this was their insurance. The supply of tubers was steady, but ambush hunting failed on most days. 
uh, when lionesses or cheetahs go out to hunt, they they may fail once or twice or three times in the day, but they come back with a kill. Ambush hunting is very iffy stuff. <laughs> and some people are much better at it than other people. Um, and this means that on what they had, if they shared all the food, the tubers and the meat, and they had specialists in bringing them back, then they had enough tubers for everybody to eat every day and everybody got a share of the meat, the good hunters and the bad hunters. And this solved a problem that all, all other predators have as well, which is how to make sure they feed the young and And the elderly and the elderly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) more important in evolutionary terms, the young. (laughs) Um, And, um, and, but this um uh let me come uh, let me come back just to that that problem of the division of labor the division of labor made people more equal this is very difficult to, for us to understand now because um we think in our society we're taught everywhere that some people make more money than other people. Some people are better than other people because they do different jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that professors should make more money than cleaners. CEOs should make more money than plumbers. This, this goes very deep in our society. And so it's hard to wrap our minds around the difference in the human hunting adaptation. But if you think about it, um, chimpanzees male chimpanzees and female chimpanzees and young chimpanzees, they, they all eat fruit mainly. <laughs> and they all sit next to each other eating fruit. They have no division of labor and they have enormous competition. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and hierarchy. And hierarchy. Same is true of baboons who mostly eat grass and sit next to each other eating grass. It's the division of labor that comes uh, with hunting that produced the equality. And the equality came from the fact that everybody had to share with each other so that the children could survive. And what that meant also was that this diet, this change in diet between tubers, fruit, and then the meat that's coming in is that we were better nourished. We were very much better nourished. More children survived. And in all this is going on over 200,000 years, very, very slowly. But about 60,000 years ago, there is this enormous burst of humans population spreading around the world um, very successfully and it's in part or no probably yeah it's in part of course uh, with the nourishment uh, that actually comes from this change in diet does that make sense it does yes um and Obviously, not to leave out the elderly people, but as Jonathan said, that the children are the evolutionary focus here. Um, what else do we need to understand in terms of human childcare practices and how these end up developing differently from other primates? One of the very most important things is that in most other primates, mothers keep their infants very, very close to them at all times. Um, And this is an impediment if you're actually trying to go out and get food. And it's because infanticide by males, male primates, is, was, and is very common. And the, the new thing, the revolutionary thing, is that among humans, human males don't kill infants. So there was infanticide, but it was always by the mother and only when necessary. What this meant was, and what it means, is that women can leave their their children, their infants, with the dads, with grandma, with the neighbor. And above all, we understand this from the near contemporary hunters and gatherers, is they leave children, little tiny children, with older kids. And that means that you have this freedom of women's labor and you have a, a way of protecting children of all kinds. It's, it's an enormous difference and very, very important. The 
other side of this, and do we want to talk about aging here? One of the other strange yes. things is that with human primates are different from our primate cousins because we live longer. Men and women live longer. Women live beyond menopause, which is not what happens with chimpanzees or gorillas and so forth. And men too. Um, so women live beyond when they are fertile. They live into old age. Men can continue to be fertile, but they also live much longer than the primate cousin males. And this means that grandma and grandpa can also look after children. This is very important. And more than that, grandma and grandpa can pass on information, knowledge, knowledge about the environment, knowledge about how a society works, about culture, about language, and so forth. And we think that that wisdom is also part of why human beings were able eventually to spread out so very widely. Um, 60,000 years ago. Um, may even be 80,000, said something I was reading last yeah. month. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and and in the caring, it's the caring for child care, but it's also the caring for each other. There's, a, there's one scientist whose name I shamefully cannot remember who's done a lot of good work about disability. Um, and the human uh, archaeological record. And what they, what she has found and highlighted from other people's work is many, many, many cases where uh, there are skeletons of people who had very bad injuries mm -hmm. that obviously would have required the other people around them to feed them and look after them for six months or 12 months or two years, or in many cases for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And th what the record shows is that the, is that people did look after each other in this way. Mm -hmm. That the, uh, the other thing, shall I tell the story about Tanzania? Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Again, this is embarrassing because I cannot remember the anthropologist's name. Um, but it's a story that highlights how important it is that people are flexible in childcare. Oh. Um, because he did field work with the Hudza in uh, Tanzania, and who many of whom are still hunters and gatherers. And after, well, we're not talking about James Woodburn. It's another yeah. person. <laughs> Um, and after they had known him for a long time, he discovered that on some days he would wake up to discover that all of the men and all of the women had gone out onto the savannah to hunt and gather, and they had left him to look after all of the children <laughs> without telling him. And he must be the... He must be the best and most trusted anthropologist in the history of anthropology. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, that's quite an example. Um, thank you for taking us through that. And I think, again, it's such an interesting idea. Of, it, it is the whole of society. It's not just focusing on the young or just the old or just this. The pieces really do all come together. Um, so thank you for helping us understand that. I'd love to turn... I suppose it's something we haven't really talked about directly, but of course is really key to this whole thing is, okay, we've got this cooperative society of looking after the children and the elderly people are passing on their wisdom and everyone's better fed. And then we've got the whole patriarchy sexism of it all um, that pops up at some point. Uh, so you talk about in the book kind of when this topic comes up that there are some rules of thumb we need to keep in mind when we are examining, when we're discussing sexism. Maybe as a way to start us off on this bit of the book, would you take us through what some of these things are? Well, let's, yes, but let's step back a step and talk about what we mean by sexism or what we don't mean by sexism in the the first adaptation, the 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 adaptation which took humans to hunting and gathering on the savannah because we don't want to miss out the fact that some of the anatomical changes that took place in terms of our our genitals, male and female, sexual sec secondary characteristics. Jonathan's all 
already mentioned that in fact our our gender dimorphism the actual size differences have consistently been reduced so we become men and women much more like each other and we actually have a a, a fun chapter about the human or the female orgasm which for many biologists was a mystery it turns out not to be such a mystery we think um so there is this disposition early on to sexual inequality, to sharing sexual joy. And I think when we understand that as part of that first human adaptation, then your question about, whoa, what is, where does this inequality, where does the sexism come in, becomes both more, more puzzling, but also more important when we actually try to answer this what contradiction, I suppose. Can I pick up a bit and then you can explain about bullies? Yeah, yeah bullies. Uh, where, where this, one of the roots of the sexism is goes back a long way, which is in our primate heritage. There, most of the primate species that we're associated with have a great deal of inequality between males and females. Um, and that inequality in human evolution, what we call the first adaptation of hunting and gathering on the savanna, it's not that that tendency of uppity males... <laughs> <laughs> of dominant males. It's not that that tendency completely went away. <laughs> it remained there, but it's that people in the hunting and gathering adaptation, they worked out a way of dealing with these bullies. It, do you mm. want to explain that? Well, I'm, what we know from the ethnographies of our near contemporary hunters and gatherers is that they demanded sharing. Um, they hated the unfairness, and there are zillions of rules about how you actually cut up the carcass of a impala or a, a large animal of some kind, um, so that everybody gets a piece. You know, um, Granny gets this bit, and Grandpa gets that bit, and so forth. There are actually these kind of butcher's diagrams that you see in the ethnographies of how meat is divided fairly for instance. Um, and we know, too, that from these ethnographies, that where some usually male is determined to, to, to hoard or to, to push other people around, people will shun him. People will actually exclude him. Um, they will run away. They will leave him behind, and therefore he doesn't have anybody to share with or to dominate. But in Actually, quite a surprising number of cases. If he can't be managed in this way collectively, people will collectively decide to kill the bully. So what we're looking at is a disposition to hierarchy and dominance, which we certainly share with primate cousins, which doesn't go away completely. But human beings learned a way to insist on fairness. And I think that's very, very important. This not just do we learn to share, but we learn to manage and control bullies. And the really, in some ways, strange thing is that uh, we do have a lot of evidence now for, uh, in extreme circumstances, when they had to deal with bullies by killing them. And in many different, many different hunting societies, in many different places, the way that they did it was that everyone talked about it beforehand. And everyone in the band agreed to doing it, and the uh, and they made very sure that they had the agreement of the man's close relatives mm. to doing this. And very often, the person who started the the killing was a close relative. It was a collective decision. Um, but once we got into agriculture. <laughs> We're in a different ball game. Yes. Is this, I mean, <laughs> sorry, that was a bit of a diversion, but an important one, I an think. An important and, one, yeah. Um, we come back to your question, which is what we call in the book, or what we call, but everybody calls, uh, this second great human adaptation, which is when about 12,000 years ago in many different parts of the world, human beings began to invent agriculture. 
it's mostly grain ag- agriculture. And wherever there's agriculture, we also see there's inequality, the advent of class societies. And so certainly the the connection, the association between agriculture and class hierarchies is not new. It's certainly not us. Every This has been known for a very long time. And But it's important to understand the reasons why this connection are is so very easy to see. First of all, um, unlike hunters and gatherers um, who have very few possessions, who can run off if they need to be, farmers are invested in the land that they work. They're invested in the harvest they depend on for their food, and they are invested in storing the, the store corn that is actually going to be the the crop for the next year. And what this means is farmers are stuck. They're stuck on the land. And so anyone who wants to take advantage of their labor to eat the food that they work to produce only really needs to organize a band of thugs to pounce on the farmers, to steal their grain, to kind of force them to pay taxes, to become sharecroppers, to enslave them, or to steal their children and turn them, um, sell them off into slavery as well. And what we say, I don't think we quite say it in the book, but we can say it here, is uh, when these bands of thugs actually get together and they build this new kind of very unequal society, um... Well, Miranda, you can guess what we call it. Um, We call it (laughs) civilization. (laughs) So this is where you were asking us about the rule of thumb. And it's a useful one, an extremely useful one. It, wherever, how to put it, the greater the inequality in human society, any human society, the more violence is actually required to keep that inequality in place. Shall I? Yeah. I mean, and, and that's where we look for the answer to the question, which is the title of the book, Why Men? Three things come together as unequal class societies begin. One is that there still are the potential for bullies. Right. <laughs> there are still those people around. The second thing is that the new elites they need to naturalize inequality of all kinds. They need to make inequality feel completely natural to the rest of us. And the third thing is that the elites need violence to keep inequality in place. Now, where do they get that violence from? Well, compared with our primate cousins, we've already said there's a slight difference in size between human men and women, on average about 15%. It's not much, but it's there. Um, there's also, um, well, put it this way. If you were disposed, uh, to bully families of farmers in, in your village and to steal their crops, you need hench people. And who would you recruit to be those hench people? Who would you seek out to be your thugs, your enforcers? You would turn to those few people who were bigger and stronger than others. The ones who already knew how to handle weapons, who already had spears and clubs and bows and arrows. And you would recruit some of them, not all of them ever. It's only a small group of hench people. You recruit some of them to be ruthless and aggressive and deadly and terrify the others. And these new enforcers, they would learn how to do those things if they wanted to keep their jobs. But, but violence, you want? No, I, I, I want to pick up on something else that a very, somebody we admire, Franz Deval, um, uh, anthropologist, primatologist, also talks about, which is when we talk about this potential for hierarchy in our human history. The other side of this is most animals, and this would apply to the primate cousins, the gorillas or the chimps and so forth, most animals are not alpha males, right? And even alpha males are only alpha males for about three and a half weeks before they're pushed off their... That's exaggerating. (laughs) Okay, it's exaggerating, but whatever. The point is that in a hierarchical society, what Franz de Waal is actually talking about is the submission of the other animals to that hierarch, to that powerful male, usually. And so 
he's saying we are also submissive apes. And I think that, again, is one of those contradictions that we need to get our heads around before we understand the third of the things that Jonathan was talking about, which is that certainly violence is never enough to keep inequality in place. And at this point in the argument in the book, We are really saying something new because what we're pointing to is that whether you're looking at histories of ancient China or Mesopotamia, rulers, elite rulers, that is the alpha humans in any particular moment, everywhere have understood from the beginning of class societies, as far as we can see, that the very, very best way to naturalize inequality is through ideologies of gender. And we think that is kind of almost the biggest new idea in the book, that these elites mark the differences between men and women. They exaggerate them, and they exaggerate them to divide and rule. And their concern is not to create divisions between women and men, though they certainly do that, but to make inequality of all kinds seem God-given, innate. Um, They make inequality seem like something that simply can't be challenged. And when that happens, it means that we really don't ask why some people live in palaces and other people are homeless on the street or why somebody has a lot to eat and other people starve. Um, Why some people live in luxury, other people don't have a, you know, Mm -hmm. clothes on their back and so on. So that's what we mean by the naturalizing is we don't Mm -hmm. ask those questions. And why is it that using gender is the most effective way to normalize this? Well, that's, that's, yeah, this is the really interesting thing we think. Um, Okay, so to hang on to their privileges, the wealth, the security, the power, these elites from the beginning really have, from the top down, created ideologies, histories, myths, stories, whatever it is, to divide and rule people, the, the very people who might challenge them. And we know perfectly well that all kinds of racisms do this very well. Skin color does this job, white skins versus black skins or brown skins. Cultural divides work extremely well. The English bulldog, the French frog, whatever. Uh, Sectarianism also works wonderfully well. Catholics against Protestants, Christians against Muslims, and so on and so forth. All of these are very good ways of creating an us and a them, of creating fear and hate. And elites everywhere use these things as well. But the more important thing is that The gender divisions that they also insinuate do this best, and that's because they divide us from the very people we love best and the people who love us. And what we're arguing is that gendered inequality, this kind of artificial division between men and women, is something we learn on our mother's knee. We're, we're taught that men and women are different because of the way we're treated as infants, because of the clothes we wear, because of the way our parents behave towards each other, because of the way other people behave to our parents. Our parents are the ones that teach us how to be a proper little man or a, you know, a good little girl. We're, we're taught basically that we have pink and blue brains. We're, we're divided by gender even before we're born, um, parents wish for, they want another little girl, they want another boy, they whatever. From the very moment you see the scan, um, you're gendered. We're then gendered in our relationships with our brothers and sisters, our friends and so forth. Everything about our lives from the very beginning is deeply gendered. And with that comes that understanding that men and women are this is a, the ideology, are, as it were, fundamentally different. And what we 
called this in the book and what we think about it as these are the love knots that we are caught up in. We're we're tied in knots um, because these ideas of gender difference and inequality are absolutely something we are we embody. We we these infest our souls, if you will. And it is, I suppose, what we're saying, the love knots, the traps of inequality that we learn through gender um, actually become perhaps the most basic and potentially hurtful of the contradictions of our lives. Mm. Absolutely. Um, thank you for explaining that. It, it is, of course, the tricky question. Um, I'd love to ask kind of in the same sort of vein, we've You've described for us the idea of sort of the hench people, right? And the uh, people trying to maintain power and doing so through violence. But of course, it's not just people in power that commit violence or commit gendered violence. Um, How can we understand, well, let's be frank, right? Often men who are not at the top of the dominance hierarchy, who are not at the top of the inequality pyramid, still committing gendered violence. This is actually part of what we're 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 taught in the myths of Gilgamesh of the ancient Middle East of the Mahabharata myths from China the Americas and so forth, is that that gendered inequality also is elaborated in cults of male dominance. Um, it's it exaggerates the as if men are all aggressive, and of course some of them are and. That perpetuation from top down legitimizing inequality and male abuse, male, you know, whether it's domestic abuse or more widely. The point is, it's a whole system again. It is an adaptation. But I think we have to go even further <laughs> in, in looking at this question. I, I think we have to think... Um, we're talking about a system of divide and rule. And the thing about systems of divide and rule is they do divide us <laughs> and they do rule over us and they do make us try to rule over each other. Yeah. It's uh, a, It creates a system of bullying from top to bottom and it's a system this the stuff about gender and gender difference and gender violence frankly is is stuff that is already internalized deep within us before we can speak mm. so it appears to be the property of each of our individual natures that's that's how we understand it and if you if there's a relationship. There's a relationship between the gendered violence and the sexual violence of the powerful and the gendered violence and sexual violence of the powerless. If you let, if you look at the Me Too movement, what the Me Too movement and all the revelations about Epstein and Saville and so on, what they have shown us is that there is an enormous protection of male violence from the top um, of the statistics are complicated, but it it's at the moment it's something like 1% of rapes actually end in a conviction in court. The whole system, the whole criminal justice system is structured in such a way it's, it's structured, I'll be brutal about this, it's structured to protect powerful men. <laughs> but the effect of it is that it protects powerless men as well. Mm. Um, a- and this is, this is the tragedy. The, the tragedy is that we hurt each other mm. through something that we learn through love. Mm. And, and because we have learned these these deep loved inequalities that we do to each other because we've learned them through love, unlearning them, <laughs> breaking with them. Drives feel, us mad. It drives us mad. feels like we're, <laughs> we is... no longer love these people or we're questioning their love. And that, uh, and uh, 
Yeah, that's enough of an explanation, <laughs> isn't it? That, no. Does that make sense? I, yes. I, I mean, think of the think of the examples in which we actually live this kind of male dominance, if you will. Um, you know, the the naughty child who's told, just wait until your daddy comes home. Mm. You know, we, we've heard those kinds of phrases. We see mm-hmm. them when we're in bed. However good the sex is, somebody's got to get up and take the kids to school. Right. Who does it? How does that happen? Well, so Who does, so it's, it's in everything that we do that inequality becomes part of a question. And it's to to not have it means that someone is very isolated, very lonesome. So if you're not dealing with this, you are probably very vulnerable to other kinds of mental mm-hmm. illness, physical illness, and so forth. You're not any longer a social animal because so, kind of social animals we are are also taught to be gender unequal. Right. So this is the key because I really wanted to ask something um, that comes up in the book that, Nancy, you mentioned a little bit earlier, and I think is such a good example of what we've just been discussing. Um, This kind of built-in socialized inequality comes up, as you've just said, in a number of places, one of which is the, quote, mystery of human orgasms, right? And especially female orgasms. And Nancy, you had a great comment earlier of like, hmm, not sure how much of a mystery this is. <laughs> what do we need to understand about this? What mystery can we really get rid of here and lead us to a better understanding of human social organization? It's it's fun. It's a very it, fun chapter of the book, actually. But Jonathan, you, no. I mean, no, she's referenced okay. me. It's your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. What we, we start... Uh, we start with an idea that we got from a very good book uh, by Sharon Jones and Loretta Cormier. Is that right? Loretta Cormier and Sharon Jones. Okay, that way around. The domestication. Uh, the domesticated penis, it's called. <laughs> and it goes through an enormous number of changes in the human penis from our anc- the ancestral primate penis. And um, what they say is that these are changes produced by female choice over hundreds of thousands of years that have produced a more user-friendly penis. Um, And this is connected to what is actually called in the literature and biology, it's called the mystery of the female orgasm. And the female orgasm, the, the mystery about the female orgasm is that it's so often so big and so much fun for women. And this this is an evolutionary mystery for biologists. They understand in evolutionary terms what the male orgasm is for. And what the male orgasm is for is to deliver sperm as close to the cervix as possible. This That's ma- what they say. That's what they say. <laughs> um uh, and they have lo- they have and so that's obvious to them and so but why what why should women have the same thing well one idea is that it's like uh it's a byproduct of evolution it's like why do men have nipples well actually men have nipples because women need nipples to nurse so males of the mammal species they they all have nipples as a sort of evolutionary byproduct. It's a bit like the appendix. A bit like the appendix. But other other people say, no, the, the female orgasm is just too big uh, to uh, human orgasm. It's just too big for, uh, for that. So their explanations, one explanation is... Wait for this. ...is from the biologists <laughs> is that it's so that women can attract and keep men by impressing the man with what a good orgasm the man gives her. Oh, Jack, that, that kind of thing. You can't see how high my eyebrows are, but (laughs) yeah, they have other equally ridiculous explanations. Um, and, um, ours is, uh, ours is that, um, it, uh, well, Ours is that through most of human history, uh, the the evidence from the anthropologists as well is that um, you uh, human sex lasts much longer than it does in other primates, typically more than t- ten minutes. Um, that it happens all year round. All year round. 
um, all year round and lifelong. Um, and that it is much more satisfying uh, that female orgasms are as satisfying and as big as male orgasms. And that this is part of, it's part of, again, part of how we became equal. And it also, it reinforces our love. Hmm. Um, not just the orgasms in pairs, <laughs> but the sex that you had earlier <laughs> in your life and sometimes on the side in small communities is really important. And also um, sex between people who are of the same sex. But what, I mean, there's several things here. We are very sexualized creatures as, as primates. Um, and this comes up in a number of ways. We do have sex all year round. Um, whereas other primate cousins, um, basically, the female only has sex when she's ovulating, so there are great gaps in in that process. Whereas we're good for sex all the time, that's very interesting. But there also the sexualization of our lives also comes in other respects, which are much more technical. The anatomical changes in the clitoris, in labia, uh, there are a whole series of ways in which our female genitals are actually different from those of other primates. And it seems to be protecting the clitoris, protecting the fun of sex from, let's say, the tears that might occur with childbirth and so on. So it's, again, looking at a very complicated adaptation of everything from the timing to the shape of the penis to um, female genitalia and so on. It's um, We're lucky, I suppose. We're not as lucky as bonobos who actually use sex. We're someplace between chimps and bonobos. Chimps have quick sex and it's pretty ugly as far as one can see. And uh, bonobos have sex all the time. They even solve conflict between... Um, uh, individuals by turning to sex. They have a lot of same sex sex and so on. So we're someplace in between, but lucky us. It's better to be in between than not at all. But but <laughs> I, I should add there's some, there's some bad news too. Uh, because we are, because we are such a deeply sexualized animal, um, love can be deeply sexual uh, love can be deeply sexualized mm. among us and that's the very good side but it also means that when we moved into a world of inequality and of violence and of domination then much of our sex could be could domination could be infused with sexuality violence se violence could could be sexualized well, um that this that this is also a part of our heritage a part of our plasticity i suppose well yes and i mean all you have to do is look at the names of weapons look at the names of big cars look at all this and you begin to see this kind of masculinize the machismo that comes with power and so forth but i'm think we're missing something of the argument again and i want to just come back to say with all of that inequality of class society and our disposition to be both loving but also very, very vulnerable because of our love. I mean, there's nothing more horrible than imagining that your child is 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 going to be harmed. I mean, this is an incredible threat. That's also why we're vulnerable. Or, or your wife or your husband. Um, we're very vulnerable because of this love. And this love is also um, important in how we resist. Um, if you remember, we have this recent adaptation of 12,000 years of agriculture and hierarchy, but we have this far, far older habit in our human heritage of equality. That's 200,000 years. And what we haven't lost that. And so we do resist inequality. We resist it by force, if need be. We risk it, risk, sorry, we resist it when we can run away, perhaps. Um, what was your example we were thinking about? You know, when you wear Lincoln green and you go and hide in Sherwood Forest. This is called resistance, right? Um, we resist it by 
creating alternative ideologies which celebrate what we share um, as human beings. We share our, our similarities, our commonalities, and so forth. This is where the golden rule comes in. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a very, very valuable understanding that people have come up with. It's not just early Christians. It's people all over the world have a variety, have a version of that. And there is actually that more recent golden rule version that we were thinking about recently, which is each according to their ability to each according to their needs. It's a golden rule, and it's one about equality and fairness. So so we've got love. It's very, very important to us as creatures. It makes us vulnerable to hierarchy. It can be turned and twist us in love knots, but it also inspires our resistance. All you have to do is think of any um, any bunch of music, and you will hear love and celebration of, of resistance, I suppose. And to condense all of this into a slogan, uh, um, in class society, love is a prison, but love is also a prison break. Yeah. Um, speaking of resistance, just to give our listeners a little bit of an idea of what else they might find in the book, would you briefly introduce us to what's going on in part three of the book and sort of how you made those decisions of what to include? Okay. Uh, we tell five stories in one chapter, well, it's in five different chapters. Um, we start with a funeral by by a funeral of a Viking slaver on the, on the Volga. Um, and in, and in, that's the, that's the very ugly story of the human sacrifice of a young female slave in a very brutal way. Um, and then we tell, uh, a story with much more resistance, the story of how Native Americans overthrew the ancient kingdom of Cahokia on the Mississippi River. Um, uh, and Cahokia, Cahokia was a bloody place with ceremonial human sacrifice of young women. But after the people who had to live under that kingdom, after they overthrew it, they lived in the central Midwest of the United, what's now the United States. They lived in equality and gender diversity for the next four centuries. Um, a third chapter tells the story of how a 16-year-old girl in medieval France became a trans prophet of peasant revolt. <laughs> we all know something of Joan's story, Joan of Arc's story, but in the book, we pay particular attention to her clothes <laughs> and to how and why her men's dress that she wore was so transgressive, um, so so much a part of peasant resistance. In a fourth chapter, we tell the story, uh, another story of gendered and sexualized resistance. It's the story of how four British seamen were hanged in 1797 uh, in Nelson's Navy for they led hundreds of their shipmates in a, in a mutiny trying to save the lives of two of their other shipmates who had been arrested and court-martialed for having sex with each other. And finally, we look at how the torture of Iraqi men by Americans at Abu Ghraib prison in 2003, how that torture was gendered and sexualized and how interrogation became collective rape. But also, we look at the resistance, at the terrified courage of one American lesbian prison guard who exposed what was going on. Mm. Well, I, what all yeah. these stories, um, sorry, they're, they're, they're meant to illustrate a range of ways in which gendered, gendered submission, um, gendered violence is also associated with resistance. It's the complexity of the argument that we're trying to illustrate. And each of these stories, in each of these stories, I suppose we're demonstrating a method that what we're saying is if you want to understand social inequality or what's happening in the class struggle, well, look at gender. And suddenly, so much is illuminated. And it works the other way around, vice versa. If you want to understand sexual or gendered relations, well, have a look at the material aspects of class relations. 
Uh, what work is being done? By whom? Who's benefiting? And suddenly, our experience of sexuality and gendering actually makes sense too. So, what it does is it brings us back to where we started. These, this, the set of ways of asking these questions actually allows us to actually begin to understand why and when changes in gendered relations take place. That was the question we were trying to answer at the beginning. It, so it helps us to understand this long and varied history of sexisms, or misogyny, or homophobia. Um, it also allows us to begin to understand why gay, gay marriage, for instance, becomes possible at the end of the 20th century. What's happening? This is a big change. Um, it's possible to ask questions now about why there is this wonderful new emphasis on trans or non-binary kinds of gendering. Why, why that suddenly come to the fore? And by asking these questions of a relationship between a material and economic understanding of people in the world and gender, we begin to be able to talk about some of these very important things. The obvious one, I suppose, to focus on is why there suddenly is this new focus on abortion, particularly in the United States. Where the hell has this come from after 40 years? Um, why, what can you, how can we begin to account for the the rise of insults or turfs? These are identities, gendered identities, which didn't exist before. Why have they suddenly come to the fore? Or to stand back and take a deep breath and say, goodness, why is there such transphobic or homophobic attitudes in the middle of Putin's understanding of the assault on the Ukraine or Trump's behavior in public? Where how does homophobia, transphobia, how does it fit with these far-right po politicians? These are the questions we all want to answer, I suspect, because they impact on our everyday lives. So the chapters that Jonathan is outlining are trying to show how, how a method can work. It's not simple, it allows us to get into detail and very specific kinds of ethnographic and historical material, but it also is relevant in our present lives. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Thank you both for taking us through that section of the book very much in outline, um, but I think it's important for listeners to be aware of. Um, as my final question, really, and of course, thank you both so much for your time and giving us this wonderful introduction to the many things the book covers. Um, is there anything you each, either individually or together, might be working on now that this book is released into the world that you'd like to preview? Oh. Uh, you first. <laughs> I don't know. I've gone back to um, the work that I did in Afghanistan uh, with Richard Tapper. And... Um, he, bless him, has gone back to the many tape recordings we did nearly 50 years ago and turned them into a, a remarkable book of people speaking for themselves called Afghan Village Voices. And for me, this, for both of us, it's very important because of the trauma of the people that we were with over these 50 years of war and civil war and so on to actually allow it has an archival, a historical um, validity, which we thought was very important. And so um, I'm going to change gear. And uh, Richard and I are actually working now on a photographic archive, uh, a coffee table book, really, of um, the same ethnographic research that we did so that you can see the people whose voices we can hear in the in the other book. And... And they're beautiful pictures. And if I can say this, one of the very impressive things is that uh, you, you and Richard got divorced 30, 35 years ago. Yeah. And they're working on books together. And I know of no other divorced anthropologists <laughs> who are sufficiently kind and civilized. 
to be able to do this. Um, I'm working. Uh, I'm working on a book about the politics of climate change and what we're going to have to do politically and organizationally in changing our societies in order to stop climate change, because we've both been climate activists for a long time. Do you have time for Nancy to end up with our inspiring little bit about how our work on uh, in Why Men is related to climate change? Please go for it. Well, uh, goodness, he set me up. Um, it's a bit embarrassing, but uh, we've the book is actually arguing that there are three adaptations: the coming onto the savanna, the hunting and gathering, the class society that we see with the Neolithic break, and we're saying that there is a third adaptation coming, and. Act three, the third adaptation then, is climate change. And we know absolutely that ecology is changing, that all society is going to change in response. And our problem is, of course, we don't yet know how. So what we're actually arguing, and we do have a very short kind of postscript to the book, which is we believe that we are entering into the mother of all struggles. And I guess what we'd like people to take from the book is that inequality isn't inevitable, that the differences between men and women that we see now are not innate, that humans once created inequality, equality, equality. Mm -hmm. humans created equality, but in confronting climate change, it is obvious that we will all have to confront the cruelty of class society and that the thugs may win. But we want to remind people that throughout human history, there's always been resistance, love, fairness, focusing on sameness, not difference, have all fed this resistance. And so it is just possible that love might win. What a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much for adding that on. Um, I'd love to remind the listeners of the title of the book, Why Men? A Human History of Violence and Inequality, published by Hearst. Nancy and Jonathan, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you.